This video is about space. The space of the mind, the space of thoughts, and the space between thoughts. How do we picture the space of the mind? Imagine your life so far as like a city, a city with a past and a present. In this city, there are ruins, remnants, and restorations, which coexist alongside the steel and glass skyscrapers of a modern metropolis. Dig down beneath the surface, and we might also find the buried layers of an ancient city beneath the modern buildings. Cities like Rome and London are like this. But if this were the psyche, the landscape of the mind, we would see a different picture. Everything in the same space, at the same level, history and present superimposed as if time and space were collapsed in upon themselves. If this were London, you would see the spire of the old St. Paul's Cathedral rising out of the dome of the current one, or the clock tower of Big Ben nestled within the old palaces of Westminster. If this were Rome, you would see both the Colosseum and Nero's golden house together in the same place. In the space of the mind, events and experiences from years back would take up as much, if not more, of the same space as those that happened yesterday. Now, to some extent, this feels right. Your experience might tell you that your past is often more prominent than your present, even though our present is what we are told to live in. But it doesn't look right. If we try to picture what this looks like, it seems unimaginable and even absurd. This is what makes representing a model of the mind, a psychical space, that accords with our lived experience so difficult. That comparison was first introduced by Freud in the 1930s and he immediately saw the problem. If we want to represent historical sequence in spatial terms, we can only do it by juxtaposition in space. The same space cannot have two different contents. Our attempt seems to be an idle game. It has only one justification. It shows us how far we are from mastering the characteristics of mental life by representing them in pictorial terms. Click subscribe, the like button, and hit the bell icon to receive notifications about new videos. For more on psychoanalysis and the work of Jacques Lacan, head to lacanonline.com. Freud loved archaeology. The desk on which he wrote those words was festooned with artefacts excavated from, or plundered from, the ancient world. But he knew that fundamentally this image of a city with its past and present superimposed upon each other doesn't make sense when we think about physical space. The fact remains that only in the mind is such a preservation of all the earlier stages alongside of the final form possible and that we're not in a position to represent this phenomenon in pictorial terms. But what do we put in its place? Let's think about some of the characteristics of the space of the mind. While well, psychoanalysis, or for that matter, any kind of psychological psychotherapy, shows us, is that psychical space is condensed and overdetermined. Get someone talking about their life and it quickly becomes apparent that it's hard to separate strands of thought, that ideas from different times and different places co-occur, and that associative links bring things into connection, sometimes in odd ways, especially when we're asked to free associate. In simple terms, talking is therapeutic when it allows a reconfiguration of that space. Someone may have been gone from our lives for years, but remained present and proximate in our thoughts. Or the places we met that person might remain invested with memories, saturated with feeling, even though that person is long gone. The unconscious knows no time and no negation, as Freud said. When all is said and done, it is impossible to destroy anyone in absentia or in effigy. In these spaces, mixing memory and desire, we find terms and images that might need to be metabolized, put into motion or put into relation, even if those relations are contradictory, in order to be dealt with. For instance, it's a rule of psychoanalytic technique, Freud said, 
that an internal connection which is still undisclosed will announce its presence by means of a contiguity, a temporal proximity of associations, just as in writing, if A and B are put side by side, it means that the syllable ab is formed out of them. This is why the archaeological model Freud used could never resolve itself into a visual image. We would always fall into the trap of imagining the past as buried, or that we're trying to unearth it, or time has passed, where what was there at one moment is not the next. But we know life isn't like that. It doesn't feel that way. Time does not always heal. Just ask anyone who's been the victim of sexual abuse in childhood. So how else can we think about psychical space? Topology is a way of thinking about any particular space whatsoever. Our psychical reality, a geographical reality, a signifying space, all can be considered as a topology. Topology is interested in the properties of a space that persist regardless of the components of that space, or the deformations in that space. This is the fundamental character of a topological space, the ability to retain its properties in spite of deformation. Topology is about the delimitation of space. Delimitation means separation. The German term is Trennung, and topologists talk about Trennungsaxiom, separation axiom, to describe the ways that topological space can be delimited with varying degrees of strength. Lacan entertained an interest in topology from the early 1950s right up until his death in 1981. The kind of topology he was especially interested in is called point-set topology, also called general topology. Now, this video won't be exhaustive, either in explaining point-set topology or the many other things that Lacan thought about topology but it will give you an idea of how it could be used to think about what is going on in a psychoanalysis and a possible way of using it clinically for therapeutic effect. A topology is made up of points arranged into neighborhoods within sets. The idea in topology is that you can manipulate the elements of a space, nodes or edges as they're also called, distort bend, transform, and reconfigure them as much as you like, and it will still retain these essential properties. For example, from the point of view of topology, if you think in terms of nodes, edges, points, neighborhoods, and sets, coffee mugs and donuts are the same thing, because each have just one hole. Here's another example. This is called a Klein bottle. It retains its properties regardless of deformations. Bend it, stretch it, it still retains its topological characteristics. A Klein bottle is a non-orientable surface because you can reach into it and pull the inside to the outside. Now let's think about the stuff of the unconscious. Signifiers. The unconscious is structured like a language, which is to say that it's structured with signifiers. The key thing about a signifying network is difference. A signifying matrix can be built only if one signifier is different from another, whether that signifier is a word, a marking on a cave wall, a piece on a chessboard, and so forth. All that matters is difference, because if there's difference, there's some kind of space between elements. A signifier is a point. It's associated with a neighborhood of other signifiers or phrases. Taken together, they form a set. We're using the term set rather than space because a set needs frontiers, limit points. A limit point of a set is used to define the boundaries of that set. Now, in general topology, there are open sets and closed sets. For a set to be open, all of its points must have some space around them which remains entirely within the set. Closed sets include points on the boundary. An open set doesn't contain any of its limit points, while a closed set does. A neighbourhood 
is an open set surrounding any point. That is, one that doesn't contain limit points, the points on its boundary. So, coming back to the stuff of psychoanalysis, if you think of points as signifiers or phrases, this means that there's a kind of protected barrier around those signifiers or phrases that defend them against something intruding from outside, from other signifiers or phrases. This is why the psychoanalyst Bernard Burgoyne, who writes a great deal of worthwhile stuff about this, argues that an open set corresponds to the Freudian defense mechanisms. What being a stable, functioning, not catastrophically suffering subject means is that you've been able to build out a series of open sets. The more open sets you have, the more signifying possibilities you have open to you. The strength of your defences is determined by how many open sets you have available to you. And we mean defences in the sense of against jouissance, against excess, the ones that protect you from an overwhelming suffering. And no open set can have the same point or signifier in common. Otherwise, you don't have the differentiation or separation, trennung, which is the hallmark of a signifying system. Spatial realities can be distinguished by the strength of separation between their open sets. Topologists refer to these as T-levels from Trenum. This is what is called a lattice of topologies. You have T0 as the weakest level of separation, then upwards to T1, also called Hausdorff space, T2 and so forth, to M spaces or metric spaces, which have very strong separation properties. The classical developmental stages of psychoanalysis can perhaps be thought of as the different levels of Trenum's axiom. So you have extreme autism at one end at T0 to so-called normal neurosis at the other in metric space. Let's take some clinical examples to see how these ideas might be relevant to practice and technique. Starting with psychosis. Lacan had a kind of model for work with psychotic individuals. Psychoanalysts should be like secretaries to the insane, he thought. Now the job of a secretary is someone who faithfully records, organises, clarifies, checks and punctuates another person's words or intentions. Secretaries don't just scribe. They ask the right questions, they seek clarification where appropriate, they put stress on certain points. Now, clinically, this is an incredibly useful way of thinking about the work. For many schizophrenics, for instance, there is no working through only a meticulous effort to specify a threshold, defensive boundaries. In schizophrenia, there is often a difficulty creating separations, distinctions between a mass of undifferentiated material in the subject's life and history. Psychoanalytic work involves carefully, delicately, but precisely establishing these separations between signifier points. For example, as markers that index moments of change, giving the subject the ability to anchor themselves within a series of signifying coordinates through which they can make a history that makes sense, or to isolate discrete moments of change. The British psychoanalyst Christopher Bollas describes how he will begin an initial meeting with someone suffering from schizophrenia by trying to establish the subject in time and place. Rather than to go for feelings or ask any abstract questions, I decided to go to the quotidian. So I would say something like, um, let me see now, you you come from what part of London? Is it again? Do you come from uh, Brixton? Is that it? And I would start out with very simple questions that had to do with location in space. And these were questions that the person could, could answer. I wanted them to be able to answer very simple questions having to do with space. All right, so you, you're not from Brixton, you're actually from Crouch End. So um, where do you live? I mean, do you live near the, the woods or do you live, what part of town do you live in? So I would 
go that way. These are very seemingly not psychological questions at all. So once I got them located in space, then I could go to time, which is history. So I would say, so, um, all right. Now, you've been having a bit of a rough patch. I understand from your parents that something happened on, was it Monday or uh, what was it Sunday? Um, there's a technique here. And parents might have said to me it was Sunday, but I wanted the patient to tell me when it happened. I wanted the patient to rediscover that time was itself important. So often a simple question like, well, what was this? Take, take me back to Sunday, would you please? Um, do you remember what you were doing on Sunday? You know, you and I can probably say what we did last Sunday. But for somebody who's had a schizophrenic episode, a question like that is extremely challenging. But you can work with it. It's not simply the yield of information per se that's so efficacious, although it is, it is important. But the functional accomplishment here, which is the rediscovery of time, and the rediscovery of one's spatial localization. Because one of the things that happens with this schizophrenic person, with this schizophrenic process, is loss of temporal and spatial local locality. Notice how the effect here is to help the subject differentiate, to specify certain points, moments, or locations that are distinct from each other in a psychical space. This is precisely what a symbolic system does. At the most minimal level, it establishes a new order of space between things, even if only as a binary contrast between X and Y. If X is overwhelmingly potent or invasive, Y creates space from it. With this minimal inscription comes a gap, some breathing room, whereby Y provides a refuge from X and can be the starting point, perhaps, for an elaboration which might eventually make things easier or more bearable. To take another example, the Danish psychiatrist Pale Villamos will ask his schizophrenic patients to name the objects in the room. At one level, this is to counter the potential bombardment of sensory stimuli that comes with the experience of a fragmented and invaded body in schizophrenia. Naming these objects does two things. It makes them less threatening, but it also makes the patient the guarantor of truth. Through nomination, there is a strengthening of the schizophrenic's relation with language. The act of naming fixes the objects in space, and the stability names offer buttress against the more porous body of the schizophrenic. Then, Philomos will take off his watch and give it to the patient. They are in control of time, they have the ultimate say, and they determine the final signification given to their words. He will ask them to describe the objects in their memory, from the earliest to the present. As this goes on, the subject will slowly introduce references to interactions with other people, allowing the construction of a personal story and granting some consistency to symbolic identifications. These can then be either assumed or rejected, making a delusion a matter of taking a stance apart from an identification. So, for example, rather than saying, I am Napoleon, and try to march to Moscow, the subject might simply be able to assert that they are not a thief. This kind of analytic work, naming, dating, locating, is often slow and careful, as it builds up the subject's ability to strengthen the separation properties of their psychical space. Placing emphasis on certain terms, signifiers, offers fixing points, limit points, for a meaning which would otherwise slide and an experience which might otherwise feel persecutory. This is not a work of construction like we might envisage in neurosis. It is secretarial work. With the neuroses, things work a little differently, but we can still use topology to think about clinical practice in psychoanalysis. A man begins the session in a state of deep depression. He feels stuck, a dreadful stuckness, and repeats these terms as if he can't put any more words to it. 
Long periods of silence ensue until he describes having walked around the streets outside the consulting room because of a feeling of restlessness. Now, restlessness is not stuckness. Regardless of the meaning of these words, we have a new signifying term, a point of demarcation in psychical space that, as the session went on, we were able to elaborate from, putting words where there was before and inertia, expanding the terms of his experience. In obsessive compulsions, we witness the subject's attempts to delimit space through rituals like counting. There is an effort to create a partition or division, and sometimes this is manifest in the way that the objects in the obsessional's physical environment need to be arranged, with certain spaces between things, a certain meticulousness to order. Often, obsessional compulsions are in relation to the body. To take another example, when we listen to accounts of people who self-harm, we find that in many cases, cutting and injuring the body is less for relief and more to mark a limit to the body, on the body, in the experience of the body. But what about feelings? Feelings affect our effects of speech. Speech which is closed up, strangulated, circular. What is pain if not a way of telling a story that cannot be said otherwise? Or a story that cannot be told, that remains interrupted because words fail? Where words can't be found, we have to find new ways of saying. And when we do, the affect, the feeling, shifts. Narratives, fictions, fantasies form in the spaces where relations cannot be conceived. Someone may give a scant and dismissive answer to a simple question like, what was your dad like? But the following session talk enthusiastically about a show in which an adopted son murders his father. This is not a denial or a refusal to acknowledge something. It's the sign of an effort to mark out the contours of a problem, to broach it while maintaining the defences against an idea that cannot be consciously assumed. Returning to Rome, it was in the city in 1953 that Lacan made one of his first and most abiding references to topology. In his famous Rome Discourse, The Function and Field of Speech and Language in Psychoanalysis, he looks for a model to describe how this mortal meaning reveals in speech a centre that is outside of language how, more than a metaphor, it manifests a structure. Some people, he says, use a circumference, a sphere or a circle to represent the limits of the living being and its environment. This two-dimensional image gives us the impression of a zone, which is one way to think about inside and outside the space of the mind. But instead, Lacan chose a three-dimensional model, that of the torus, because a torus peripheral exteriority and central exteriority constitute but one single region. Why is this important? Because it's an alternative to the model Freud was always dissatisfied with, a response to the problem of how to represent the psychical space of human subjectivity. We can get to the torus via the Mobius strip, Drawing this on the blackboard during Seminar 24 in 1976, Lacan showed his audience how the torus and the Mobius strip are continuous. They have the same topological properties. The torus can be cut, and when it's cut, can become a double Mobius strip, with one inside the other. If we look at the Mobius strip, for instance, we see that both inside and outside are continuous. If you traced your finger around the surface, you would move from the top to the bottom seamlessly without lifting your finger. There is no underside. For Lacan, this solves Freud's problem of finding a visual representation of the unconscious. On the Mobius strip, we don't have a divide between an above and below, or between a surface and a depth. As he describes it in Seminar 24, it is very precisely what is going to give us an image of what is involved in the link between the conscious and the unconscious. 
we can think of the ego in similar terms. For Lacan, the ego is constituted via an alienating identification with the other, assemblable. The Mobius strip shows us that the self-other distinction dissolves when you think of psychical reality like this kind of surface. Paranoia and oatomania, where idealization and persecution are so closely related, can be thought of with this topological model. Lacan kept coming back to topology throughout his life until just before his death. His pronouncements on the Taurus in particular are extremely strong. A Taurus is the structure of neurosis. It's not an analogy. A Taurus really exists and is exactly the structure of the neurotic. Topology is not designed to guide us in structure. It is the structure. Man goes round in circles because the structure of man is toric, and the world is toric. Jacques Alain Miller views this 30-year interest in topology as part of a pattern in Lacan's work which he calls the combinative. You see this in Lacan's interest in signifiers, mathemes, schemas, and then topology. They all consist of a mapping of space through matrices. A signifying network is an organised topology of combinatives. For signifiers and language, we can substitute points and neighbourhoods of a topological set, and we will still be talking about the same thing. The other is just the space of combinatives that make up a topology.